than 12,000 B-17 bombers were built during World War II. Fewer than a dozen still fly. The Flying Fortress was designed to fight its way to the target, drop its bombs, and fight its way back home. Today, the bomb bays are empty, the guns are silent, the crews long gone, except for a lucky few. Isn't that a beautiful aircraft? It's like a piece of sculpture. Well, this looks familiar. Robert Rosenthal was a B-17 pilot and is a survivor of 52 missions. You're coming in here with your parachute on and your Mae West, and it was a little tight. Of course, I was much thinner at that time. By 1943, America's 8th Army Air Force began to fly bombing missions to Germany. Robert Rosenthal flew with the 100th Bomb Group. These are the controls for the four engines. And you see there, each one can be manipulated separately. And you try to adjust the engine so that they're all synchronized. Heavy bombers from 41 bomb groups were stationed in Great Britain. B-17 was slow, it was unpressurized, it was unheated. As a result, it was difficult to operate. That being said, nobody else had anything much better. The 100th Bomb Group became operational in June 1943 and was based just north of London. Using great pleasure to accept the station, on behalf of the United States Army Air Force. 30 B-17s and their crews were posted there. They were made up of 300 young airmen, supported by 3,000 other personnel, from ground crews to officers and pilots. Bless these crews. Amen. This base became a temporary home, a base whose sole objective was to bomb Germany. One of the original crewmen of the 100th, Harry Crosby, aimed to become a pilot, but eventually became a navigator. On the one hand, it was glamorous to be part of the original, and, uh, and on the other hand, <laughs> it was not a habit for me. Of the original crews who went over, only 14% got the 25 missions, 86% were shot down. By the end of World War II, the 100th Bomb Group suffered great losses after dropping some 20,000 tons of bombs on Nazi Germany. Inevitably, as time moves on, there are fewer to remember bygone days. Some of the 100th gather to look back and identify old photographs. This is a classic old picture everybody's got. To so you just flew 25 missions? I survived 25 missions. Well, you and we were known as survivors. We weren't known as having them. Completed the tour. In just eight missions, the 100th Bomb Group lost more than 80 crews, earning the nickname the Bloody 100th. Uh, yeah, we've got that one down. Pretty beat, too. The 
the B-17 originally had been foreseen as a bomber that was fast enough to be able to outrun any enemy aircraft. Of course, by 1940, 41, 42, the, the aeronautical revolution had spread to fighters, and they were now fast enough to catch the B-17. Fighters like the American P-47 Thunderbolt and British Spitfire protected the bombers, but couldn't fly further than the German border. Without these escorts, the B-17s were extremely vulnerable to the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. The only solution was to put machine guns on them, and then this B-17 now became the flying fortress with you know, 13 50 caliber machine guns bristling. The main job is to bring these airplanes back. We've got plenty of ammunition. Keep them out there at long range. Each gun has a range of 1,500 meters. Most of the crewmen on a B-17 spent a part of their time in the air as gunners. There were two waste gunners, a ball turret gunner, a tail gunner and the top turret gunner who was also the crew chief. The navigator also doubled up as a gunner. The radio operator had a top gun and the bombardier had nose guns. Hello fellas. Well how was it? To recruit gunners the Army Air Force commissioned the actor Clark Gable to make an enticing film. We have the privilege to meet General Laker, Commanding General, 8th Air Force. Captain Gable, our gunners are already the best in the business. But if they were only 10% better, it would cost the Germans another 100 fighters a month. General Laker frequently pushed for better bombing. Unlike the British, who bombed at night believing it was safer, the Americans bombed during the day, when industrial and military targets could be seen and hit with some precision. But Churchill wanted the Americans' assistance during night bombing raids. However, it was decided that both air forces couldn't fly in the same airspace at the same time. And continuous bombing would give the German defenses no respite. So in a mutual agreement, it was decided that the Americans and the British would bomb Germany around the clock. confident that daylight precision bombing would work because they had the Nordam bomb site packed with gyros, motors and gears. The Nordam site took into account wind, temperature and drift. Everything was planned about dropping bombs accurately. And if you screwed that up, there was no point to going. You were exposing people to danger without accomplishing anything. So the crucial part of the mission was those last minutes as you approach the target and we would turn the plane over to the control of the lead bombardier. All right, Steve, we're on the IP. She's yours. I got her. Every squadron of 100th bombers had a lead plane with a lead bombardier who had a Nordam bombsite. At the crucial moment, the bomb site took over and flew the B-17 on the bomb run, straight and level to the target, holding speed at 240 kilometers per hour. I remember the way the bombardier was sat up in front of me and was hunched over that, and I remember every time when, um, when, when he dropped the bombs, he'd raise his, hand, his left hand and say, bombs away. When the lead plane dropped its bombs, 
It was the signal to the others to toggle their bombs away. And then somebody always said, well, let's get out of here. Airmen claimed that the Nordam bombsite was astonishingly precise. The Americans were counting on pinpoint accuracy to defeat Hitler without the horror of trench warfare. In a combined effort, the British and the Americans launched the first round-the-clock bombing of a German city, Hamburg. The mission was called Operation Gomorra. The British targeted the areas where the workers lived, and the Americans aimed for the shipyards. The so-called precision bombing came to nothing, however. A huge firestorm totally destroyed 25 square kilometers of land, killing 50,000 people. Three weeks later, anxious to prove that precision bombing could work, the Americans decided to attack the target highest on their list, the town of Schweinfurt. It was here that 50% of Germany's ball bearings were made. It was thought that without them, the Nazi war machine would grind to a halt. Schweinfurt was well beyond the range of the fighter escorts. In an effort to confuse the Luftwaffe, a double strike was planned. 230 bombers would hit Schweinfurt. Your secondary target this morning is the airport. 146 aircraft, including 21 from the 100th, were to bomb the Messerschmitt factory at Regensburg, then fly on to North Africa. It's the country club of the German Air Force. <laughs> The Germans had some very competent fighters in the war, ME-109s and FW-190s. They also had some very good pilots who were responsible for downing many Allied fighters. tail attacks, sometimes when we had heavy contrails. They'd sneak up in the contrails, you wouldn't even know they were there. And uh, they'd shoot you, shoot you up then. Tail gunner Bruce Allshouse, nicknamed Curly, volunteered for gunnery service, not fully appreciating the dangers of aerial combat. They always said there was no atheists in the foxholes. I don't think there are any atheists in an airplane either. On the Schweinfurt Regensburg mission, Crosby's crew found it particularly difficult to stay on course and deposit the 225 kilo bombs on the Messerschmitt factory at Regensburg. In response, the Luftwaffe fighters swarmed around them for more than two hours. They used up three boxes of shells. So and as the shells came out of the belt and the spent cartridges came out, they were all over the, the, the floor. Just, you couldn't walk. 
exactly. It was murder. We just, we just got hit all the time. Our plane was really hit badly. The 100th lost nine planes, but Crosby's and six others escaped south across the snow-covered Alps and the Mediterranean Sea to the sands of North Africa. These home movies show a group of carefree young men far removed from the recent aerial fighting. But the painful reality is that the double strike mission cost both air forces dearly. Of the nearly 400 fortresses dispatched, 60 were lost. 600 men gone. Their fate unknown. Precision bombing is a relative term. In World War II, a bomb landing within 300 meters of the aiming point is on target. Typically, a group of B-17s dispatch their bombs at the same time, leaving a carpet of destruction on the ground. World War II entirely altered previous attack strategies. The ancient art of war, soldier fighting soldier at close range, was disconnected by miles of altitude. We were fighting in, a, in an arena. We had virtually no information on other than the few experimental test pilots who'd been up there. And these guys were up there all eight, nine, ten hours at a time. The temperature at the target to be comparatively warm, minus 25 degrees centigrade. There was no heat in these airplanes. Guys were freezing to death, minus 50, minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit up there. The prime combat casualty of World War II among Army Air Force's personnel was frostbite. Despite these shortcomings, the B-17, with its 1,000 horsepower Wright Cyclone engines, could carry 1,800 kilos of bombs to a range of nearly 3,000 kilometers. Unfortunately, most airborne time was spent in hostile airspace, unescorted. After the losses on the Schweinfurt-Regensburg mission, night missions by the Americans were once more considered. Replacements for the 100th were needed for the 90 men missing in action. One of the newcomers was relatively old, at the age of 24. Robert Rosenthal, also known as Rosie, had recently finished a law degree. He was vehemently opposed to Nazism. I would sometimes lie in bed looking up at the stars at night and, and uh, wonder if I would survive. And I prayed that I would survive and live to be the ripe old age of 45 years. How do you intend to make it? Sir, we'll assemble the second... As the Allies prepared for D-Day, control of the seas became increasingly crucial. This made the port city of Bremen crammed with ship and U-boat yards an obvious target. On October the 8th, the men of the 100th flew a routine flight northeast over the North Sea, anxiously watching for signs of attack. When nature called, condoms were put to imaginative use. We used to use the helmet liners 
it'd freeze it up, and then when you were letting down over England, you'd crack it against the bulkhead and throw it out the window. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> Not if you got hit yet. <laughs> we threw it out over Germany and we called them Blivet bombs. <laughs> Space was severely restricted, especially for the gunner in the tail. Well, it was a lonesome feeling. It was. There's no doubt about that. Several times I'd get a hold of somebody to make sure that all the engines were functioning correctly because I had my back to the front of the aircraft. You had uh, a couple little pads to put your knees on on each side. You sat on a, like a bicycle seat. I had twin 50 caliber Browning machine gun mounted on one mount. And I had a piece of armor plating in front of me, probably about that wide. And I had to reach around that. And that's the position you were in for, well, sometimes seven and eight hours with that same position without moving. Every B-17 had its place in the bomber formation, beginning with its V of three. Two Vs made a squadron. Three squadrons made a group. One leads. One high, one low. Three groups made a combat wing. 54 planes or more spread out more than a kilometer wide, each wing following the next at four minute intervals. A thousand bombers took two hours to cross a single point. Flying the tight formations that these guys flew was extremely dangerous. You're absolutely glued with this guy a few feet away. And you're jockeying the throttles, and you're moving this wheel, which takes about 50 to 100 pounds of force to move. You're very, very tired. Secondly, you can run into that guy. And there were many mid-air collisions, many, 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 where you just ran together. Then you had the friendly fire problem. The guy would be excitedly tracing a 190 coming through, and he'd stitch the guy next to him. Collisions and friendly fire were serious threats to survival. Over Bremen, the fighters and flak were even worse. You could just walk on the flak. And there were just these, these black poppings of these missiles, and you'd see them, and there'd be a hole there, and a hole there, and a hole there, and you'd maybe be a fragment there, and you'd think, how on earth did I escape this? What's that, flak? Some pilots had a knack for dodging flak. One such man was John Luckadoo, nicknamed Lucky. His fortress survived Bremen. Seven others were not so fortunate. We were in the Purple Heart corner, the low squadron of the low group. Any flak coming up from the ground, we would be more vulnerable to it than people higher up in the formation. Secondly, the fighters were prone to try to pick off the fringes of the formation. The position where you start your attack is very important. Out of the sun, out of altitude, all things like that. But you are not always able to select a position because you were attacked. The battle for air superiority was being fought in the skies over Germany. Luftwaffe pilots were now forced to defend their homeland. The fighters were pressing their attack even through their own flak, which we had never experienced before, in such a desperate attempt to drive us off the target. Another 110 at 10 o'clock. The Germans tried every angle in search of any weakness they could exploit. Occasionally, rammings occurred, the result of either frustration or selflessness. I have 
I myself rammed. The ramming was the last resort, I want to say. The last resort. Certainly for the pilots it was the frustration of your guns not working, and so you rammed. You lost your head. You didn't think, and you only saw your goal. I came down in my parachute and said to myself, you'll never do that again. The loss rates at the, at the worst part of the bombing campaign hovered just below 50%. And the time you average it all out, it comes somewhere around 10%. The infantry loss rates were under a percent. All right, you guys. Two days after the raids on Bremen, Munster was targeted. Breakfast at three, briefing at four. Rosenthal and his crew were tired, having flown a 13-hour mission the day before. Munster was their third mission in as many days. At the briefing, crews were told that they're to target the homes of railway workers. Many airmen have seen the indiscriminate German bombing of London. Now, Americans will bomb civilians. Gentlemen, it is coming up. A pilot remembers, I was disappointed. The smug assertion that we aimed only at military targets was comforting. 45. Others held very different views. B-17s went off to war with this idea that war can be short, it can be quick, it can be relatively bloodless. And yet what they found in the skies over Europe was just as awful as the trench warfare in World War I. When we arrived into Germany over occupied France, we were hit by waves of fighter planes that kept coming at us. There were several hundred of these planes there. This B-17 that I attacked burned fairly quickly, and I didn't expect anyone to still be alive in there. But in the middle of what we call the cheese cover, the gunner sitting in the top bubble, there were two or three meters that weren't burning yet. And since I was only 20 meters away, the gunner turned his guns on me and fired so much, my plane started burning too. I had to do what a German pilot, no, any fighter pilot should never do. I had to bail out at 24,000 feet. Look, he's bailing out. Don't yell on that intercom. The Luftwaffe swept through our group and shot down every plane in the group except our plane. The bloody 100th lost 12 planes over Münster. We had two very seriously wounded waste gunners. We had a rocket hole through the wing. Two engines were knocked out. And we went to the target alone and dropped our bombs. And as we left the target, a whole gaggle of German fighter planes started to queue up. I did various maneuvers, chandelles and lazy S's and and some violent maneuvers to get them away. And when they left us, I ordered the crew to throw everything overboard to lighten the plane. And we fired flares as we landed to alert the ground crews that we had wounded on board. The ambulances came and took our wounded away. One hundredth was severely depleted. One hundred and twenty crewmen were dead. There was an eerie 
silence there. Nobody seemed to approach us. Some of the members of the crew were pretty shaken up by the experience, and I tried to comfort them, and, uh, and we went on with our lives after that. The bombing of Munster left 500 civilians dead and 25,000 homeless. By the end of the war, as many as 600,000 Germans died in bomb attacks, along with 30,000 American airmen. It made us all give second thoughts as to what our chances of survival uh, individually might be. Remember, we were 19, 20, 21-year-old lads who were into something that we didn't really know how to cope with. Morale was a big problem, and so the minute any time anybody was shot down, they immediately cleared the barracks and brought another crew in. Literally, it was this abrupt. Just bang, you never saw an empty bed, you never saw an empty spot. Breathing in five, let's go! By the end of 1943, the American bombing campaign was in crisis. Bomber losses were too high, and the Luftwaffe was getting stronger. The Americans decided to wait for the new long-range escorts, the P-51 Mustangs, to arrive. The Americans took this opportunity to regroup. about the same time the order was sent out that we're not supposed to try to camouflage the aircraft anymore. We want them shiny aluminum so that the Germans can find us. If the bombers aren't there, the German Air Force has no reason to come up and fight because only the bombers can do damage on the ground. So in a way, they're bait. Formations increased from several hundred bombers to more than a thousand. This attracted the Luftwaffe, but the Mustangs were there to greet them. A little friend would come up and say, big friend, I'm with you. They had wing tanks, and you'd be watching them, and if you could see a, a glitter uh, of the light, you knew that they were dropping their wing tanks, which means they were, that they saw bogeys, and we'd tune in on them, and we would hear them yell with glee as they'd go after those guys. Uh, uh, right, 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 right. Watch it, fellas. 109 to 10 o'clock. Hell in the blue flight. Looks like they're trying to land us away from the bombers. The bombers were relentless. The Americans were desperate to achieve air superiority, believing that without it, any land invasion was doomed. On the morning of March the 4th, 1944, a new target was announced. Everybody present accounted for. When they had the briefing and they pulled the curtain back and the, and the tape went all, all the way to Berlin, to Big B, they call it, boy, they, 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 first it was just stunned silence and then just a shout, glory that they were going to go to the big one. Berlin was protected by thousands of flak guns, operated by boys. Hans Ring was just 15 years old. Das war also ein ungeheuer 
It was an incredibly impressive picture to see the American combat boxes approach with the contrails trailing behind them. And you could hear the endless sounds of the American engines when they came. It was amazing. That scared me half to death. Jordy's been hit by the number four. And we got shot up pretty bad uh, on the way back. Uh, there were a lot of a lot of holes in the aircraft. Fortunately, there were none in the tail. Yeah. We fired about 150, 200 shots per cannon and were lucky enough to have participated in the shooting down of three American bombers. We set up 31 that day and we lost 15 out of 31. We had 16 back. And I was glad it was my last mission. Bruce Allshaus, Curly earned his membership in the Lucky Club. Well, Ben, now that we've been the first ones to Berlin, how would you like to go back again? <laughs> Two days later, Rosenthal bombed Berlin on his 25th mission. Some of the crew urged me to buzz the airfield in celebration if we returned. I decided, well, they had a, had a rough tour and I was going to give them a buzz job. The plane was really lower than the top of the tower, and I could see the people observing in the tower hit the deck. And when we landed, somebody said, did you know that General Huglin, who was the wing commander, was up in the tower, and he hit the deck, and he messed up his uniform. And I said, oh, Rosenthal, you've really, you've really screwed up this time. And there was General Huglin walking toward me, and my heart sank. He came over and grabbed my hand, and he said, one hell of a buzz job, Rosie. Bobby, do his open. Instead of going home, Rosenthal signed up for a second tour. The Americans had been running daylight bombing raids for more than a year. By the spring of 1944, the bombing was routine, though hardly precise. The Allies had gained air superiority. They invaded Normandy and advanced upon Germany. But Hitler stood firm. Rosenthal signed up for a third tour. On September the 10th, 1944, on a mission to Nuremberg, his plane was hit over the target. And three engines conked out. We looked around for a field to crash land, and there was a very small field out there, and we chose that. Struggling to fly on a single engine, Rosenthal's B-17 crashed in France. And uh, I just remember waking up in a hospital in Oxford, England. You could uh, lose three engines and get home. You could uh, lose half of your vertical stabilizer on the tail and get home. You could lose one of your airlines and get home. You could literally have a hole in the fuselage that you could 
have a whole bunch of people walk through and still get home. Upon being discharged from hospital, Rosenthal was transferred to a ground job in command headquarters. But Rosie wouldn't have any part of that. He insisted that they put him back in, give him another crew, give him another airplane, and he'd go on flying his tour. Most guys, all they want to do, like me, is fly your missions, go home, you know. And Rosie, he wanted to keep on flying, keep on keeping on. By now, Germany was on the brink of collapse, but would not surrender. On February the 3rd, 1945, the Americans delivered a massive air raid upon Berlin in hopes of ending the war. The bloody 100th was selected to lead the 3rd Division. Rosenthal flew in the lead for the 100th. And I remember going there and the sun was shining and I almost dozed off. There were no problems at all. On the way to the target, <laughs> we were hit by flak. The plane caught fire. I thought it might blow up at any time. When the, the entire crew had bailed out, I decided I'd better get out myself. And when I left the controls, the plane went into a spin. B-17 out of control at 3 o'clock. According to the official log of the 100th, Major Rosenthal went down today over Berlin on his 52nd mission. Rosenthal is a legend here. The entire base feels bad about it. And I pushed my way out of the front hatch and cleared the plane and opened my chute. And I hit the ground very hard and broke my arm again and was in, in a state of shock from hitting so hard. And I looked up and I saw three soldiers coming at me with guns. One of the soldiers raised his gun and was about to strike me, and I noticed the Red Army symbol. And I yelled, Amerikansky, Roosevelt, Stalin, Churchill, Pepsi-Cola, Coca-Cola, uh, lucky strike. And they recognized me as an American, and they then embraced me. The capital of the Third Reich was ruined, but aerial bombardment did not win the war. Running out of targets, the Allies decided to crush German morale by attacking one of its most beautiful cities. Dresden was full of refugees fleeing the advancing Russian army. On the eve of Ash Wednesday, 1945, the British attacked twice within centuries. 10 hours later, the Americans launched their bombs into the firestorm. The old American idea of marksmanship of aiming for a target, no longer applied to the bombing of Germany. And that's what makes the bombing of Dresden. If you want to talk irony, there's the real irony that a nation so committed to precision bombing would turn to area bombing. It was a terrible stench over all of Dresden, of burning and ashes and burned corpses. It was horrible. Up until 1945, I feel that the Allied bomb offensive was completely justified, also morally. But in 1945, after the war was lost, to even then drop all those bombs like maniacs on civilians was absolutely incorrect. I don't believe anyone placed the blame on the people flying the planes. I believe the people blamed the whole war.
As the Second World War drew to a close, Major Rosenthal reached Moscow. He cabled the 100th, saying, hold my job open, I'll be back in a few days. Our intelligence officer said, Rosenthal, you stupid He said, if you hadn't come home, you would have had the Congressional Medal of Honor posthumously, but now you're not going to get it. General order number 93, headquarters 8th Bomber Command. Instead, Rosenthal was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. After Germany surrendered, he stayed in Europe as a prosecutor for the Nuremberg trials. The bloody 100th dispersed. This airplane flew over 100 missions. Most survivors never flew the B-17 again. They told me when I got there, the odds of finishing the tour was nil. I was very relieved, ready to go home. Well, you couldn't go in a bar and buy a drink. Somebody buy a drink every time. Of course, with every drink, you shoot down a couple more fighters. <laughs> 